To host and chair our panel discussion this evening, we are joined by Jill Donnell. Jill is an experienced leader, motivational speaker, author and personal development mentor who has spent much of her working life promoting the role of women in the workplace. She served for 30 years as a police officer and over 20 years ago was at the forefront of introducing both domestic violence and child protection units into the force locally. In 2009, she was awarded an MBE for services to women, and in 2015, she won the Dorness, Dorset Venus Award in the Most Influential Woman category. She is currently also our co-chair of the Wessex Museums Trust, so I'm delighted to welcome Jill, and Jill will now introduce the rest of our panel for tonight. Thank you so much. Harriet, thank you, and welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today um, as we discuss one of Thomas Hardy's most famous works, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, which was first published in 1891, interestingly, with the subtitle A Pure Woman. I think it's fair to say that the novel sparked conversations around the world, not just in Victorian society, on violence against women, consent and justice. And for me, these are very pertinent themes still being discussed today, some 130 years later. So with the help of my amazing guests, we're going to explore Tess's story the situation of women generally at that time, and then link that together with the relevance for women today. And somehow we're going to attempt to do all this within an hour. So let me introduce my three guests tonight. Professor Angelique Richardson. Angelique is Professor of English and a Historian of Science at the University of Exeter, where she leads the Hardy's Correspondence Project which is in the process of digitising the 5,000 letters received by the Hardys. Angelique has published widely, widely on science and culture, and her books include Love and Eugenics in the Late 19th Century, After Darwin, Animals, Emotions and the Mind, and Women Who Did, Stories by Men and Women, 1890 to 1914. I shall be talking to Angelique shortly. I'm also joined by Dr Rose Wallace, Rose is Associate Professor of British Social History and Associate Director of the Regional History Centre at the University of West of England. Her research is focused on the dynamic relationship between law and society, and she has a particular interest in 18th and 19th century criminal justice and criminal justice heritage, the English magistracy, social protests and regional government. Rose is the consultant historian to Shire Hall Historic Courthouse Museum here locally in Dorchester. And finally, my last guest is Lady Edwina Grosvenor. Edwina is a criminologist, a prison, uh, start again, prison philanthropist, not easy to say at this time of night, who has dedicated her career to transforming conditions within prisons, drawing on the experience of best and worst models of criminal justice from around the world. She became the founding investor and ambassador of the Clink restaurant chain and is the founder and chair of the charity One Small Think. But more about that a little later. Angelique, can I start with you? Do you think you could, for those perhaps that haven't read Tess, give us a quick pricey of the novel and we could then perhaps pull out some of the themes that it discusses uh, and perhaps the significance of the novel in terms of Hardy's greater opus? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Tess is the story of a young working class woman, though she's descended on her father's side from the ancient D'Urberville family. When her family fall on hard times, they seek help from a local nouveau riche landowner, Alec D'Urberville. They think from his name that he's a distant relative, though he has, in fact, simply bought the name. He takes advantage of her and abuses her in a rape or seduction scene. But there's another man in the story, Angel Clare. They marry after meeting at the dairy farm where Tess works after losing her child. Angel, though, is unable to get past Tess's past, which she reveals to him on their wedding night. He abandons her, leaving her to support herself. Eventually, after being exploited as a farm worker, Tess goes back to Alec in return for his supporting her family. But when her husband returns to her, wiser and full of remorse, and Alec taunts her and insults Angel, she kills him for the life he has subjected her to. She is found guilty of murder and hanged. Now, Hardy 
served as a magistrate between 1884 and 1919. He sat on 38, uh, he, he sat 38 times and he also served on grand juries for the assizes. So he had first class experience of the courtroom, though not as a judge. So uh, we're going to come on a bit later on to uh, Hardy and uh, his experience of the justice system, particularly something in his earlier life. But perhaps you could expand a bit more around the themes of the novel, because I mentioned earlier on, you know, this was quite uh, maybe a shock to uh, Victorian society around morals and religion, something around those themes that, that you found in the book. Yes, perhaps. Above all, Tess is a story about class, about the oppression of the poor. Alec is a nouveau riche landowner and he fails to recognise the worth of a working class woman. He takes advantage of her and of her sense of responsibility for her family. And the novel contains exploitation of other working class women, depicting the harsh working conditions that they're subjected to on the land. Hardy was acutely aware of poverty, both in his own extended family and in Dorset. Tess's refusal of financial support from Angel during their estrangement similarly places her still further outside of convention and indicates an unspoken feminism, albeit it's one that's pursued at great emotional and economic cost. But Hardy sustains our compassion for her and shows us the injustice of the world speaking out for the oppressed and marginalised. Now, the, the novel has a subtitle, A Pure Woman. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts about that. Yes, A, a Pure Woman Faithfully Presented. Now, yeah. he doesn't give us the scene in the novel where Tess is violated. Instead, he emphasises through that subtitle that Tess is a pure woman. In the serial version, came out in the graphic magazine, Tess goes through a sham marriage. In the first book version, she's drugged. There's a druggist's bottle. And in all subsequent editions, the reader does not see what takes place. All we need to know is that she was wronged. And that is what that title speaks to, Tess's purity beyond notions of, of social convention. He, he, he wants us, he's urging us to see Tess herself outside of social judgment. And that's what that subtitle does. OK, so I think uh, um, we've talked on previous talks here that we've done that, you know, Hardy's work addresses a number of issues, particularly I, I've, I've heard him described as a feminist. Have you got a view as perhaps why he waited so late in his career to tackle this you know, serious subject? Yeah, he had actually been saying something similar for a while. In 1904, in an interview with William Archer, he says, what are my books but one long plea against man's inhumanity to man, to woman, and to the lower animals? And he'd considered many of the themes that we get in Tess earlier. For example, we have the seduced or abandoned women. We have Fanny Robin in Far From the Madding Crowd or Lucetta in The Mayor of Casterbridge. We have class oppression, Marty South in The Woodlanders. But by the time of writing Tess, Hardy's age 50, he's more sure of his craft and his position. He's successful and he could afford to upset the critics. The 1890s too, which is when the novel is, is, well, it's both set really, and it appears were more hospitable to radical thought, both about women and class, more so certainly than the 1870s. And Hardy was perhaps more inclined and better placed at that point in his life to see the extent of man's inhumanity. I think probably this novel uh, is his his loudest plea against that inhumanity. Um, so I'm interested in, particularly, I mentioned in the introduction, the Hardy Correspondence Project, and I know from conversations you and I previously had, there was a significant amount of correspondence he received about Tess. Can you tell us something about that? Well, yes, that's right. Tess was and is the novel for which Hardy is best known. and sales of Tess surpass that of any other of his previous works. And we see that reflected in the correspondence that he gets. 
and the reviews, it was uh, received positively, though there was then some hostility in reviews to the notion of uh, a pure woman. Um, but he he gets lots of letters from the public. And the ones that I think are um, among the most uh, memorable and important, really, and, and they're ones that he kept, they kept out of the Max Gate bonfires, are from women, uh, young women who have had similar experiences uh, to, to Tess. So I'd like to read from just uh, three of those that you can see up on um, our Hardy Correspondence Project website here at Exeter. Um, in one, well, one, uh, we, we also get uh, some from um, May Sinclair that I might be able to come on to. But let me give you this one. Uh, let me find it now. There's one from um, uh, a young woman called Emily Pass, and she's writing from New York in 1927. So Hardy's 87 then. And she writes, I feel I would like you to know how much it has meant to me. I am 20 years old and am sympathetic with Tess, the more so because some of my own experiences in life have not been unlike hers. The book is more personal to me than any book I have ever read, or I think any that I shall ever read. Another young woman, Betty Thomas, who'd been born in Glasgow and wants to play the part of Tess in London, writes to him in 1925, and she says, I am so interested in Tess because I have read it many times, each time more absorbed than the other, each time living the part, and then in real life experienced nearly all the tragedies of your Tess. She goes on to say, no girl could ever have had the tragedy in life that I have without losing her mental balance or seeking oblivion in a reckless existence. And she signed her letter off with Mrs. in inverted commas. And then there's another from a woman again in 1927 who says, I've never read a book in which I felt something of myself, as in your so well painted Tess. I think Tess's character is so beautiful. It is never weak. She always gives and never asks. Who deserves punishment, she writes. Tess, least of all. And she goes on to say, I think life's so difficult and several troubles I have had, I met in this book. Oh, I wish that there are more people in the world as you are. Would you understand a woman? Tess is the first book I read of you and I hope to read more soon of you. And May Sinclair, the suffragist and modernist, wrote something very similar. She writes in 1909 and she says, I think you got the psychology of Tess always and profoundly right. That's brilliant. Thank you. And for me, I guess that that's sort of 100 years ago, perhaps what you'd have now with uh, a book, people writing on social media, their, their understanding and feeling similar situations. And there we have some women writing over 100 years ago to Hardy. Angelique, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll be coming back later with some great questions from our audience. But I, I want to move us on if I can. Uh, so you've given us great praise of that novel and talked about what it was like at the time, certainly in Tess's position. Rose, can I come to you? Um, because you've got some fabulous experience about Martha Brown. I won't steal you thunder. You can tell us about that. So, so maybe you could tell us, we could talk a bit more about situation for women around this time. And you could tell us all about Martha and her connection with Hardy. Thank you, Jill. Um, thank you, Angelique, for that really brilliant introduction to the no novel. And it resonates so much, actually, with some of the things I want to, to talk about in reflecting on Martha Brown's case. So Martha Brown was a former farm worker, so a similar, similar social status to Tess, who ran a small shop in Birdsmore Gate uh, near Broad Windsor in Dorset. In July 1856, she was tried for the murder of her second husband, John Brown, and was found guilty and sentenced to death at Dorsetshire Hall, which is now the Courthouse Museum that Jill mentioned. And she was executed at Dorchester Jail in front of a crowd of three to 4,000 people. Amongst that crowd was Thomas Hardy, as a probably very young man in 1856, and it was that experience of witnessing her execution that I think is widely accepted to be believed to be the inspiration behind Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Um, I suppose there are there are quite sort of 
significant differences, I suppose, in many respects around their personal histories. But I think in two key respects, there are really strong connections between Tess's, the story of Tess and, and Martha's, Martha's history. Um, so I think probably the really important point to highlight and the closest connection is the fact that both Martha and Tess killed their abusers. So not until after she'd been sentenced um, did Martha finally confess to the circumstances behind her husband's death. Facing yet another physical assault from him, she had snapped and, in her words, struck him several violent blows on the head, which she immediately felt, felt in great remorse for. But this didn't come out until after she was, she was sentenced. I think the other thing that is important about both Martha's history and, and the sort of themes that Angelique has alluded to, but the story of Tess itself, is the fact that these women are connected because they are effectively judged twice because they are women. So not just according to their crimes, but against expected standards of feminine behaviour, so how far they measured up to the feminine ideal. I think it's important to highlight at this point, not perhaps in particular, but certainly growing kind of in the Victorian period, that the role of women as wives and mothers was really important. They were the, the moral compass of the household. So they played an important societal role in that respect. But there's also this enduring concern about women's capacity to be corrupted and also then to be corrupting. So this kind of image of Eve, I suppose. And in this context, Martha's crime then was one of the most heinous. She hadn't just killed someone, but she had killed her husband. I mean, that was a distinct crime, a form of petty treason until 1828, not in 1856, but it was considered particularly heinous. And the judge drew attention to this in his sentencing. He said she had sent to his account not only a fellow creature, but the being she had solemnly vowed to love, to honour and to obey. So I think that kind of encapsulates that, yeah, the sort of the problem of this being a woman and a wife who did this. And we see the same sorts of feminine standards framing most of the discussion around, um, around the case. So the press coverage, the prosecution case as well. Um, a lot of attention was paid to the fact that Martha was older than her husband, varying estimates, but it's around about 20 years. And there was a sense that this was an improvident marriage. And she was also reputedly jealous of another younger woman and a lot of um, kind of the press highlighted a number of points, the way that she behaved in court, but had sort of during the kind of pretrial processes, they kept acknowledging that she was very good looking, that she was a handsome woman, but that she was cold and unfeeling and unfeminine in not betraying any emotion about what had happened. I think what's sort of, well, equally disappointing from my point of view, is that the defence counsel also draw on the same tropes when they're trying to make their case. Um, and I have to say that, you know, their case was incredibly ill-prepared. They only had about 24 to 36 hours to get it together before she was on trial for her life. Um, they claimed that such violence could not have been committed by a woman, that this was clearly a brutal male crime, therefore she couldn't have done it. They even said, you know, if she was going to do it, she'd have poisoned him because that's what women would do. Um, they also how, highlighted how, you know, she behaved as a proper wife. She would performed all her domestic duties. She'd cooked his dinner and obviously not poisoned it. Um, and they also, and this is something that struck me when Angelique was talking about Tess, they kind of use a woman's precarity in terms of her economic position as well to make the argument and they say you know why would she have risked ruin by killing him they said it was in her interest to keep him alive so they're using the same tropes to make make their defense as well um was, Rose was her treatment unusual for that period or, or did you find it was quite typical in your in your experience in in some respects, the case is typical, perhaps in that I think for the majority of most of women, whether they were perpetrators of crime or indeed victims of crime in the 18th and certainly 19th century criminal justice system, would have faced the same sort of scrutiny about how far they lived up to 
the kind of correct standards of womanhood, not just, you know, whether they were, um, you know, whether they committed the crime or whether they were truthful as a prosecutor or victim. But the case is unusual in that it becomes part of a national debate about the use of capital punishment and the treatment of women in the criminal justice system. So whilst you know, I've sort of talked about how critical people were of Martha, um, there were an awful lot of petitions sent um, asking for a reprieve um, of the death sentence, particularly from Dorset actually, claiming that Martha's crime was manslaughter, that she was provoked, particularly after she was confessed that this was a crime of passion. Um, slightly unusually, actually, after her confession, her solicitors went back to Birdsmore Gate and got sworn statements from her friends and her neighbours, many of them who've been prosecution witnesses, um, to support her case. And they uniformly testified to her humanity and kindness, the care she'd shown John, her husband. But they also gave clear evidence of his infidelity and violence against her and this was coming from some of his family members as well who'd confirmed that Martha had shown them her bruises and that they'd actually had to keep him at one point away from her to stop him from assaulting her. Um, one neighbour even suggested that the screams that she heard on the night John died were Martha's and not John's. Um, but this information didn't come out at trial. It wasn't, it was laid before the Home Secretary who had the power to commute her sentence and he refused. Um, and this is where it kind of gets bigger. Um, there's a whole slew of press coverage comparing Martha's case with another case of Celestina Summer, who was tried in April, so a few months before Martha. She'd been convicted for the violent murder of her 10 year old daughter but her death sentence had been commuted. The Home Secretary, who's George Gray at this point, was roundly criticised for showing summer mercy. Um, and it was kind of seized upon by the movement to abolish capital punishment, who claimed that it appeared women would no longer be hanged. And if you aren't hanging women, then how could you apply the law to anybody else? Gray defended his position in Parliament and said this was absolutely not the case. So Martha's fate was essentially used to prove a point. Um, the examiner put it like this, and I think it's, it really sums it up. Her execution, Martha's execution, was to set right what Summer's reprieve had deranged. And we have Gray's calculations. We have handwritten notes wow. um, across the sort of papers relating to this um, in the Home Office collections. And they're shot through with the same sorts of gender stereotypes that we've already been discussing but also again thinking about what Angelique was saying about class as well I think that's there um Summer was according to Gray's calculations a much more sympathetic and womanly figure he actually notes this he says that there were no legal grounds for a commutation of her sentence but public execution uh, sorry public opinion would be against her execution he um because she was only 24 she looked a lot younger than that um, she'd been seduced at the age of 14 and had apparently been mistreated by her husband. So she kind of encapsulates the image of the fallen woman. She's naive and pitiable. She was also middle class. She was well educated, came from, you know, a kind of trade, wealthy trade family and, and had kept a servant. Martha, by comparison, was a much less sympathetic figure. She was an older woman. She'd married a much younger man. And she didn't at any point betray any vulnerability. And in fact, it appears she lied um, in court. And she's also a working woman as well. And the local vicar from her community, the Reverend Mallon, wrote to the Home Secretary and he claimed that she came from a community where adultery, arson, theft, robbery and prostitution are a matter of course. And he thought that she should hang for the sake of what he called public example. So we have this terrible conjunction, I think, for the need of a public example, both from Malin's point of view, but also Gray's, to prove this point that you do still hang women, that the law is still upheld. And this judgment based on the social construction of what was proper femininity. And it meant that there was no consideration of Martha's experience of abuse. And she was hanged for it. Yeah. Wow. Rose, thank you so much. I mean, 
shocking, but sadly, I'm going to have to say uh, I'm not surprised and uh, and I'm probably saddened more that there's a part of me, if I think, you know, I was dealing with domestic violence cases 20 odd years ago and and those gender stereotypes that you talked about, those societal expectations, uh, I'm not entirely convinced um, have gone away. Uh, and perhaps that brings us nicely round to a talk with Edwina. So, so Rose, thank you. That was just amazing. That's wonderful. I, I want to talk, Edwina, about the relevance of tests today, uh, you know, around victim blaming, uh, some of the cases that we've had more recently, certainly in, in my own experience, those stereotypes. But maybe first, you could perhaps give us a little introduction to your work with one small thing, because I think that will be of real interest to, to those with us tonight. Yeah, sure. So um, I've worked in the prison system for about 22 years, started when I was about 18. And one small thing was set up to um, try and get uh, the prison system, prison officers and the sort of hierarchy within the prisons to understand trauma and to understand trauma through a gendered lens. So when we look at women's violence, it's very different to men's violence. And what drives a woman to be violent is often very different to what drives a man to be violent. We know, for example, that women tend to internalize violence, so they're more likely to self-harm. Uh, men tend to externalize the violence, they're more likely to lash out, punch someone, start rioting in prisons, which you don't see in the women's estate. So if staff don't fundamentally understand that, then you know that's a problem because actually prisons could be run more safely, prison officers could do their job more effectively if they have a sort of basic understanding of these things. Um, so in a nutshell, really, that's what one small thing does. Um, I think, you know, it's all quite depressing, isn't it? Because uh, we're talking about the 1800s and Tess and Martha. And I, in my head, sort of think Martha and Tess are basically sort of the same person because of course, Hardy's experience of Martha I believe led to obviously um, Tess and, and the writing of that and the profound impact uh, Martha sort of had on him. And I popped along to see Harriet at the museum in order to record um, the podcast that we did together about this topic. And it just really struck me that, um, and you know, I'm an optimist, my cup's always half full, but I did slightly walk away going, oh my God, you know, I know so many Tesses. I know so many Marthas. Yes, we don't execute anymore, but when you think to our government and the acts that have been passed, the Domestic Abuse Act was passed last year. Um, domestic violence became illegal in America in 1994. Um, you know, these things are sort of slightly depressing. I mean, the Domestic Abuse Act in 21, the statutory definition of domestic um, abuse for the first time came about, emphasizing that it's not just physical violence, but can be emotional, controlling, coercive, economic. Um, you know, that's so recent. Um, when I started working in a women's prison, I was probably about 21 when I first started, I was in Manchester. And um, I remember the officers saying to me, it's really weird, Edwina, all these women are in here um, either because of domestic violence and they've committed a violent act or um, something to, you know, or they, they've experienced that in their lives. But we don't have any help for these women in this prison around domestic violence at all. And I thought that's odd. Then I go into a sort of male prison, lots of men in for violence against women, their girlfriends, their partners, no perpetrator programs for domestic violence. It's got a little bit better. There are a few things out there, but really it's it's still very, very patchy. And of course, many um, of the people listening will know of the high profile case of Sally Challen in 2010. She murdered her husband after years and years and years and years of abuse. Um, and she was charged with murder. She appealed it and then got her sentence reduced and did come out. She was supported by all her friends. She was supported by her two sons who saw the abuse that Sally had suffered over years. Um, and really, so 2010 was the first time that we saw coercive control coming in as an actual recognized thing that the police are still sort of grappling with. 
you know, they still sort of, it's, it can be sort of tricky for people who maybe haven't experienced it to, to understand. Um, so I think that sort of leads on nicely to a point that um, both the other speakers have mentioned, which is about class. You know, when I, I work across all the women's prisons, um, do I see people like me, people from an affluent, posh background? No. Um, you see women from low socioeconomic groups um, who don't have money. A lot of them will leave without even a pound in their bank account. It's not like they don't have much money. They have no money. Prison represents a safe place to them. So the governors will say to me, Edwina, I could take the walls down. They won't want to leave. And people misinterpret that sometimes as, oh, prisons are, are holiday camps, or that just means they're too nice. It's like, no, the community represents such an incredibly scary place for women, often, that they would rather be in prison. Because on the whole, they are safe. You know, and that's Great Britain 2022, you know, that's really not okay. I spent um, quite a bit of time working in the women's prisons in California. And um, I remember being in a room with 60 women who were all serving life without parole. And I said to them, look, I don't know why you're all here. I don't know all your individual sentences, but I can imagine that the vast majority of you have suffered at the hands of a man. And that might be why you're here. And honestly, the reaction was unbelievable. They all came up to me afterwards and sort of started telling me stories of abuse. But one lady said to me, but do you know, Edwina, I'm serving life without parole. That's basically a death sentence. But she said, I'm free. Mm. I was like, what? She said, I am free. I'm free from abuse. I'm free from being raped. You know, this is freedom to me. You know, and you sort of think, how are we getting this so wrong? And, you know, I think these crimes need to be seen in this sort of history of the provocation that that particular woman has suffered. Now, I'm not here to say whether murder's right or wrong or whether a history of abuse is worse and how these things get judged in court, but how is it that a man or woman can abuse someone for so many years to drive them to the point of killing and that's somehow not as bad as then a retaliation, as a murder. And I think the justice system in our country really sort of gets this piece wrong in the sense that danger and dangerousness gets mixed up with risk. So Sally Challen, for example, she goes to prison for murder. So it's lots of people who don't think about criminal justice like I do obsessively all day long, um, will be like, oh, she's a murderer terrifying oh my god I was in the room with you know it's just like, ah murderer but is she a risk to the public no she's not did she kill someone yes should she have done it no you know but I think that's a really interesting debate dangerousness yes versus risk so so the last thing I'll say because I don't know how long I'm wittering on for so do stop me <laughs> no um, there's plenty of time you carry on so when I went to the museum and met with Harriet um particularly those letters so when Hardy got written to, I was like, you know, seeing those letters was like seeing the Me Too movement stuck on the wall of the museum. Only it wasn't social media. There was no hashtag. But the women that I work with as well, you know, they want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want their trauma acknowledged. And often it helps their mental state when you say, do you know what? Maybe you deserve to feel angry. Maybe you deserve to feel violent. Maybe, maybe you deserve that. And for someone just to acknowledge it, and I think Hardy, by writing about Tess and creating her character sort of through Martha, um, did that. He sort of validated these women. He sort of said, I, I see you, I hear you, sort of through his book. You know, the fact that they were compelled to write. Um, I think that was so powerful for me. And I sort of, Harriet and I was sort of sitting there recording the podcast going, oh, it was sort of not exciting, that's the wrong sort of word to use, but um, but it was just so sort of here we are in 2022 and we're looking at this really familiar story back in the 1800s. And, you know, and of course it will go back further than that, but um, it seemed to me like it was the sort of the Me Too movement of 
of the 1800s. Um, I'm interested, Edwina, particularly, uh, I guess, my own personal experience of how women were presented in court, whether they were rape victims, victims of domestic violence. Uh, and we know these days that the statistics in terms of, uh, you know, cases being successful through the courts is scarily low. Your experience, uh, you talked about uh, explaining to prison staff the differences between men and women. But, uh, you know, Rose was talking about, for me, it was that that um, priest's description of her, those expectations of at the time of, of how women should behave uh, and people being unable to get over the fact that uh, this was a woman and this was her husband and she wouldn't do that sort of thing or uh, certainly murdering children. Do you still see that sort of expectation for women, how they should behave, that it hinders them in terms of, of well, in, in effect, what we're saying is what are the jury going to think? Because they're the ones that are going to make decisions about guilt or not. Yeah, so I think particularly when it comes to mothers, actually, and I do a lot of work with sort of women who are being sentenced to prison and that sort of separation of the mother and the child, because women are usually the primary carers. You know, the men are often dads too, but the men who get sent to prison aren't usually the primary carer. Um, so when a woman goes to prison, they usually are the primary carer. And so, you know, you get a lot of these sort of comments of she should have known better. She is a mother after all. And you'll see it written in the media. She was the mother of four, you know, X, Y, and Z. You very rarely sort of read that when it comes to the men. You sort of don't say, well, he was a father. He was a father of three. You know, it's quite interesting. And I wrote my um, dissertation to my master's just recently on um, the media depiction of female victims of rape particularly. But, you know, and then we can bring in the victim blaming, Again, all the hallmarks of Martha Brown, you know, um, those sort of traditional gendered roles of why didn't she know better and, um, you know, all those sorts of things. You know, they're still sadly um, alive and well, which is, you know, quite depressing. Yeah, and I think it, you, you're quite right in terms of particularly rape victims, um, uh, female victims, uh, but particularly, I think if you talk about the media's descriptions of women, you know, just women uh, that are, are depicted, whether they are uh, in positions of authority, just generally depictions in the media, there are inevitably expectations of how people should behave or how women should behave. And they're not always terribly helpful. No. OK, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I. I've, we have had a number of questions, and I wonder if it would be uh, helpful if we had a look at some of those. Ah, uh, here's Harriet with some. <laughs> Hello. Um, yes, we had an amazing number of questions and some amazingly detailed, interesting ones. So um, just I think uh, the first one is from an anonymous um, questioner, and it was asking specifically about Tess and Alec from Hardy's uh, perspective. So if we take Tess's sexual exploitation by Alec as being perhaps consensual, might that not offer an interesting commentary on Hardy's thoughts about exactly what a pure woman is? Is there an argument to support the idea that Hardy was suggesting there is nothing wrong with the sexual rep relationship between young people outside of marriage? And would this fit with his broader views on organised slash institutionalised religion? So it's an amazing question to unpack there. I'll leave you, Jill, to kind of unpack it and delegate it. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Uh, Angelique, I think I'm probably going to, to come to you to start, as you would expect. Um, so it's interesting, isn't it? We, I, th I think you, when you were talking earlier on, that there are, uh, would it be fair to say, different versions of this story, different versions of the incident, if you like. Um, so the question is about if we take her sexual ex exploitation as being perhaps consensual. I got a question mark about that. Does that give us an interesting commentary on Hardy's thought about exactly what a pure woman is? Um, and, and your sense, do you think there is an argument that Hardy was suggesting there was nothing wrong with a sexual relationship between young people outside marriage? Sorry, you're muted, Angelique. The, the terrors of Zoom. Thank you, Jill. Thank you to the questioner. Um, 
There's lots to say to that uh, question. Um, if I can start off with the question, which I think is very different about whether um, he thought that um, men and women should and could be in relations outside of marriage. Absolutely. I mean, the Woodlanders, uh, which appeared in 1887 in the preface slightly later, he says, you know, this is where he sets out to um, address the uh, immortal puzzle, he calls it, the, 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 the question of the relations between the sexes. And it's a novel that looks at hypocrisy and the constraints um, of, of men and women uh, who sign themselves up to something that um, and then, you know, things change, but they're contra in a, a contractual arrangement. Um, and he's also looking at, at, at structures of patriarchy quite intensely in that novel. Um, he writes also about how he thinks that it's the role of one of the roles of fiction to address the relationship between men and women as it is rather than um, how it should be. And he challenges the idea of the, the sort of happy ever after ending, which some of his uh, female counterparts um, are also doing in the new woman novel of this time. But there was also a question there about uh, whether he thought it was consensual. I think that's a, a different matter. I don't think this is a consensual no. uh, relationship at all. Uh, she may uh, most be seduced. Um, she's... Uh, it's it's more likely she's raped. She's certainly it's it's certainly um, an act of violation from Alec, and that's that's made very clear throughout the novel. But I think the indeterminacy of the text is because he's urging his readers, and in lots of his other writing, his prose writing about writing, he wants to put some of the responsibility onto the reader to do some of the work. He says it can't just be the author um, and he talks about the moral profit of reading um, and the moral profit of reading Tess is to think about why, why you know there's a prurience that he doesn't allow you know he doesn't give you that scene uh, but what he does give you is a woman who has so clearly been wronged that you shouldn't ask to know more um, that I think I think that's what's going on there, uh, let me let me see if there's more elements to um, that question. No, um, I, think, I think we're. I think that's that's fab. Thanks, Angelique. But also talk about religion because it touches on that, and I think yeah. Each other. Just very briefly, because um, we've had, um, you know, um, we've had um, comments about religion and how you know institutionalized religion. Um, uh, was not uh, on Tess's side. And that's something that the novel does engage directly with, religious hypocrisy. But there's also intimation in, in the novel of a god of love. Um, Tess christens her child herself, and Hardy reminds us that Angel closing his heart to Tess is like he's closing his heart to the church, but that's not the church that abandons Tess. And it, for one vicar who writes... In 1928, Hardy's novels were recommended reading for any priest, he writes, preparing to work in the countryside. And I'm just going to quote, it's just a short sentence. He says, from Thomas Hardy, this, this priest preparing to work uh, in the countryside would learn the essential dignity of country people and what deep and often passionate interest belongs to every individual life. Now that is a priest who's read all of Hardy's novels, he's read Tess, who comes to a very different conclusion. So I think it's important not to assume or homogenize uh, the church or the readers or reviewers. Okay, that's great. Now there's another question, Angelique. I'm sorry, there's quite a few here that I'm just interested in your perspective. Um, to what extent do you think Hardy invites us to hold Angel to account for Alec's death and, and therefore also Tessie's hanging? And, and is the traditional view of Angel profoundly misplaced? I don't know what the traditional view of Angel is. is it, I'm assuming that um, uh, our questioner is suggesting that he's he's the good one. Um, I think he becomes good when it's too late. One of the uh, possible titles for the novel was going to be Too Late, Beloved, and it certainly is 
um, alas, but um, I think what Hardy does is, is challenge the binary. Um, so much of his work is about challenging binary thinking and he challenges the binary that Alec is all bad and that Angel is all good. I, in, indeed, his name sort of, you know, is held up and shown to not really be that fitting of him at all. Um, and there's one point where the narrator says, if only um, Angel had been more animalistic. Now, remembering that um, Hardy thinks that our relation with animals is one of the most important things to, to remember. You know, when Hardy uses the word animalistic, it's not in a derogatory sense. What he's really saying is if only Angel could have listened to his bodily instincts, the instincts that, that drove him to love Tess on their wedding night, to have realised that this was a woman who had suffered so much. And actually, Angel has also had a, a past, uh, but the, the sexual double standard is alive and well in the 1890s, as I suspect it is today. And so that's of no consequence for Angel, whereas it is for Tess. And, and and Hardy's saying, you know, if only Angel had been less of a head, less of just a mind and a body as well, a body that was able to, to love and receive Tess as the woman she was. So I think that's a really important uh, and, and really quite unconventional intervention in the, the woman question debates of the time. OK, that's great. Thanks, Angelique. Rose, I've got an interesting question here. I don't know whether you can help us out around the justice system at the time. Peter Smith is asking, why not send Martha stroke Tess to penal colonies in Australia? Was murder too serious for this or was it because she was a woman? Well, I mean, I think, as I sort of, you know, suggested in, in my kind of uh, opener, that at this particular case, Gray is proving a point, you know, that there, there won't be a commutation. Celestina Summers actually institutionalised because they sort of they yeah they decide that she's she's mentally unwell um, and is yeah put in through a series of asylums and um, dies in Wiltshire I believe not long after she's sent there. In theory, yes, she could have been transported. Although I have to say, by eighteen fifty six, that's winding down. Right. Um, and some people were transported if they were mitigating circumstances around a killing. Um, it wasn't necessarily murder. And I mean, this is what the petitioners, I suppose, were driving for, not for her transportation, probably for her incarceration in a prison. But that, you know, that this was manslaughter, this was provoked, that this wasn't premeditated, which is the key distinction between murder and manslaughter. Um, and and yeah, it, the weight of evidence was absolutely ignored. And I think, you know, it's not just my sense of this, it's it's picked up picked up in the press that Gray is proving a point. Yeah, yeah, shocking. Um, another question we've got here um, is around Hardy's time as a magistrate. So perhaps I, I don't know if you could answer this. If not, I'll go to Angelique. Um, do we know if he stood up for anyone or stood up against any typical Victorian values? Did he perhaps write about his views in this area? I think Angelique will definitely have to come in on the right okay. around the yeah. but um, he served uh, primarily as borough magistrate. So that's sort of, I mean, Martha Brown was tried in an assize court, which is the sort of equivalent of our crown courts now. So yeah. they deal with the most serious crimes and had the capacity to pass the death uh, sentence. So we have, oh, sorry, the quarter sessions, which were like our magistrates court. So the borough sessions were perhaps, yeah, a bit, they were magistrates courts essentially. Um, so he'd be dealing with lower level offences yeah. than this. It's interesting, though, his role on the grand jury, which Angelique mentions, that's oft, grand juries are often overlooked, partly because we don't have them anymore. They were abolished in 1933, if I remember rightly. Um, but they decided which indictments proceeded to trial on the strength of the prosecution's evidence. So if they didn't think it was a strong enough, this is pre-Crown Prosecution Service, um, if there was a you know, if a case was too weak, that they would chuck it out. But there are instances where you can see indictments being pushed forward or withdrawn. So he actually had a sort of, yeah, a degree of power in doing that, I suppose. And that okay. would have been at a serious level. at a side. Yeah. yeah. Okie doke. Let, let's go to Angelique then. Angelique, are you aware of any writing he might have done about the reality of, of his work as a magistrate or any particular views about the justice system at the time? 
in his letters, um, he does refer to um, some of the cases that he's um, encountered. Um, interestingly, uh, he is sent or perhaps opts for uh, cases around food profiteering during the First World War. That's something where he thinks that, again, you know, it comes back to those in positions of power exploiting that and taking advantage of the poorest. So that's what he's mainly doing um, during the, the war. I've written a piece on that um, in the LRB a little while ago. Uh, if you just you know Google hardy food profiteering, that would come up and that will give you some of the things he says uh, about that. But I think I'm gonna have to refer you to a wonderful book by Trish Ferguson um, on, uh, it's called Thomas Hardy's Legal Fictions, which for anyone interested, in um, Hardy, what he says about the law and his engagement with it, um, I, th I think that's a really good place to go. Okay, that's great. I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions. We've had loads of lovely questions. I just want to um, find the one I was looking at that maybe I can speak to Edwina about. I mean, we have touched on this slightly, but one of our attendees has said, how might Tess's experience of gender, class, all kinds of discrimination compare if it were to happen today in Dorset in 2022? What kind of things would be similar? What kind of things might be different? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, you know, to me, this is this is um, a modern story. It's just written in, in the 1800s. Um, I think when it comes to reducing a sentence of murder to manslaughter, quite often a woman, if she talks about having a mental health issue, it's easier or a woman feels like she has to medicalize the reason she, she committed the violent act, which again shifts the blame back onto the woman, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, that happens a lot. Um, I think if Tess was around today, she would go to court, um, probably her emotions would be questioned. Um, the fact that she was uneducated, she was poor, she was vulnerable, that would all stack against her in a court. Um, a, a woman who goes into a court today, you know, they're terrifying places. I mean, I spend quite a bit of time in court. I'm educated, I'm not poor, I'm not that vulnerable. They're still incredibly intimidating places. Um, I think I sort of see actually the only difference is that we don't execute women anymore. And that sounds really depressing to say that I think that's the only thing really mm. that might have changed other than we're talking about it more. We understand the struggles. Um, we live in a more vocal society, but actually legislation is very, very slow. And then, of course, laws get passed by our government, yet the understanding that has to land in our services, like the police force and the probation system, the judges, the Crown Court judges, you know, it's very, very slow and still not today quite understood in the way that I would have hoped in 2022 it would be. By now, indeed. Um, uh, we've got another question, actually, that that's sort of talking about similar sort of things. Um, and that's questioning why we think Hardy entirely misses out the trial of Tess. And would that happen simply because she confesses or would it simply complicate Tess's story in a way that's unhelpful to his narrative style? I mean, from what, what Edwina has just been saying, I think if we're looking for positives, there's more support for women. Well, anybody within the criminal justice than there were in the days. Rose talked about the in my mind, the shocking defence of uh, Martha and I think you said 24 to 36 hours to prepare that defence. Um, so I'm wondering whether some of these are the reasons why he might have missed out the trial. She confessed, so presumably there wasn't that much to report. Have you got a view on that, Rose, or shall I defer to Angelique? like to hear Angelique's opinion on that I think there is an interesting point around some of the things that Irina was just saying and your point about the sort of lack of support and the really shoddy defence um which I can say now we can come back to in a moment when Angelique's commented on that key question. Okie doke. Angelique 
Thank you. Um, I think this is partly, again, Hardy handing over some of the responsibility to his readers. He's told us very clearly what he thinks. This is a pure woman faithfully presented. I think he would have been reluctant to hand Tessie's story over to a very male environment, which would be the, the, the court setting, and more male commentary on it. Um, I think also um, as a writer, he's He's working with a model of, of the Greek tragedy, um, which is it's poignant in its simplicity. And so I think there is something to be said for the complications uh, that that would add to the narrative, as well as the voices that, that really I, I, I don't think Hardy wanted to detract from his centering throughout that narrative on Tess and Tess's story. OK, thank you. Rose, anything additionally then? Um, yeah, I was just thinking, as you said, about sort of levels of support and things like that. Angelique makes a really important point about <clears throat> the masculinity of a courtroom at this point. Absolutely everybody in that space who has a position of authority, the lawyers, the jury, the judge, they're going to be men. And we have to remember that it was packed. There's a public gallery and it was Martha's trial was heaving. So the sense of what she must have been going through in that space um it's absolutely extraordinary and I think I agree with Angelique actually that Hardy didn't want to include that and also it would be incredibly complicated to re rehearse so much of her story in that context I was just struck by some of the things that Edwina was saying and, and your comment Jill actually when I was thinking about why Martha didn't say anything about the circumstances of her husband's death until after conviction I was sort of looking at you know not as an expert like Edwina or you actually but looking at some of the research that had been done around women who kill or attack their abusers um, and why the sort of barriers to disclosure. And it took me sort of down this sort of line looking at the criminal justice system as part of that barrier. And I'd actually be quite interested to get your perspectives on this that resonates so much with Martha's case that she couldn't adequately prepare a defense, that she was being judged by all men, that she was facing the community and the family to which her husband belongs, that she'd always claimed that she loved her husband, despite the fact that she'd killed him. And I was looking at sort of some of the more modern research on it that seemed to reflect that sort of same lack of, as Edwina sort of indicated, proper support for abuse victims in terms of creating trust so that they can talk about their defence, so that they can disclose, um, that people don't want to talk about these things in court, in front of these communities and their families. And that, you know, there were lawyers in this report to the Centre for Women's Justice I was looking at who were still saying that women who don't show emotion in court come across as unsympathetic to juries. And I'm like, you know, Sabrina said that carbon copy from 1856 yeah. to a report that was published, I think, last year. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah, um, I'm with you there. I've sat in many a courtroom listening to comments being made. Um, Edwina, your view. Yeah, you know, it comes down to sort of weaponizing women's emotions in the courtroom against them. Um, and, you know, when we look at rape victims, I mean, how many times have we heard, well, her skirt was too short. What was she doing walking around after dark, for goodness sake? You know, she must have brought it. She was jogging with earphones on. Um, and you sort of think, hmm, that's really interesting that we're still hearing those things today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I can only sort of agree with what the other two speakers have said about that, really. Um, much yeah. work to be done. Yeah, still much work to be done. Angelique, any comment from you about that particularly? Sorry, you're um, mute. muted. There we Sorry, go. can you remind me of uh, which question? Well, we're just talking generally about support for women in the criminal justice system, or should we say lack of it? Mm. Um, we, we don't want to be too pessimistic here because things have undoubtedly changed considerably. But thinking if the, the correlation are around Tess and Martha, the lack of time to prepare her defence, the all male courtroom, the the what we perceive as the inability to talk about it. Have you got a view at all around that? Well, I think that Hardy, through all of his work, is pointing to the oppression of women, and he would have seen the same now, unfortunately. You know, he'd have seen enormous continuity, I think, with the time he was writing about and the 21st century. Okay, 
Can, can I just add um, sort of one more thing that sprung to mind? And, and again, yeah. the sort of gendered nature of the sort of very um, masculine, uh, prisons are very masculine, courts um, are better, actually. You know, there's much more female judges, but often women will say to me, you know, I was abused by that man, I was abused by that man. And then I went into court and I put my trust in this man, you know, their lawyer, or the, you know, and, th and then that was broken too. So I think there's something around that, um, around the man and the male and the power and the authority and that sort of abuse of control as well and, and authority sort of particularly in, in the courtroom that is still quite prevalent today. Okay, thanks Edwina. Right, it is just past eight o'clock. We've just got, um, I'm gonna have to make a, a bit of a, a judgment here about what we should, uh, a last couple of questions. There's one interesting one here asking what you all think about the sexualization suggested in some commentaries about Hardy's response to Martha Brown's death. And does this affect our reading of the novel? Rose, do you uh, have a view there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I won't, I'm, I shan't comment on whether it affects my reading of the novel. I, I, I hold on to Martha very much, although the inspiration for Tess is there and we've talked a lot about the resonances. I hold on to Martha as a real woman who lived and died. And that's kind of important for me. Um, he does make reference and it, it, it could be, I will be honest, I find it like the way he sort of objectifies her death, although it obviously moved him. And we have other, other evidence that he, uh, he was, um, that yeah, he had deep sympathy for them. Um, there's the amazing quote from Hester Pinney about him talking about them, Tess and Martha, as if they were just sitting in the other room together. But he does talk about this woman being mesmerized by the body turning around on the rope. But I think that, I find quite difficult. I find quite difficult, at least. Yeah. Okay. Angelique, can I come to you? Yeah, I think he's. I think he's shocked by the hanging, but I think that there is a sort of uh, critics and biographers tend to be salacious in their responses to Hardy, um, and I think that that uh, partly behind some of the reading there yeah okay thank you uh so i'm going for one final question because it is five past eight um and this one uh relates to one of our previous talks uh elizabeth larry i'm thinking it was last week but uh you can find it on our uh, youtube channel so do head over there uh, uh, and Elizabeth uh, was talking about his first wife. And the question we have here is, how do we reconcile Hardy's treatment of his first wife with his standing up for women in his novels? I, I'm happy to start with that one. Uh, what do we mean by his treatment? I mean, we're referring, I think, again, to the salaciousness and the myths or disinformation about Hardy and his first wife. If you look at the correspondence, um, both, you know, incoming and outgoing uh, you know these are people who have so much affection for each other they um take up cycling together how many couples in their 50s go off cycling for hours together you know this is a companion at marriage uh, emma chose to move into the attic she wasn't pushed out into the attic which i've heard people say with no evidence whatsoever um you know, and it, it's actually that in itself is quite sexist. It's assuming that that uh, Emma doesn't have a voice. Um, I think that um, yeah, it's it it doesn't surprise me these 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 responses, but they're not borne out. I mean, Hardy and uh, Emma shared a domestic space. Domestic spaces are not always easy for um, couples to share. Uh, to extrapolate from that that um, a sort of deep sexism and a dissonance with his novels, uh, I, I, I think is to, to uh, overstate a point. Um, look, look for the evidence, look at the letters, not look to people who are making money from saying what the letters don't really bear out. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Angelique. Uh, Rose, do you have any comment on that one? No, I do not know enough about his personal relationships to comment. So I shan't. I think actually the way Angelique summed up 
the the way we should think critically about the production of these accounts and the histories and you know all the commentary um i'm as a historian always advocate going back to the evidence so yeah brilliant thank you well uh i think uh it, it is now gone five past eight i just want to say a huge thank you to our panelists for certainly for being a fascinating insight, not into just Tess and her story, but how, for the situation for women both in Victorian times as well as today. I hope we haven't been too pessimistic about the current situation. I just want to reinforce the amazing work that Edwina and her team are doing uh, and that, uh, yes, things have changed. There is no doubt about that. But sadly, there are still too many expectations placed upon women uh, and not enough, perhaps, understanding about uh, the old Venus and Mars situation. That's certainly my view anyway. So thank you all so much for taking up your time. Thank you to all of you that have been watching us. I'm now going to hand over to the amazing Harriet, our uh, in-house expert on Hardy, to just finish off and tell uh, people watching what else is available through uh, our various channels. Harriet, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jill, for chairing. And thank you so much to our three panellists for your amazing input. It's wonderful to hear how the fictional life that Hardy created through Tess actually has such a kind of real story behind it. And also to hear from Edwina how much relevance that still has to the current day, but also the things that are being done to try and change the potentially scary parallels that we see between um, the two. Um, as Jill said, we've got some other events coming up, but not many left now. We have the Far From The Madding Crowd film screening, which is happening on Sunday, but um, I am both pleased and dismayed to say you won't be able to get tickets to it because we have sold out. And so um, thank you so much to all of those of you who have bought tickets and come and say hello to us on the day. Um, but if you've missed out on that, our final talk will be on the 25th of October and is Building Wessex Parallel Lives and Passions, which is where we will be joined by Andrew Zeminski to talk to him about his experiences of working with historic buildings as a SPAB scholar across Wessex, um, some of them overlapping with the ones that Hardy himself worked on. And so talking about those parallels there and his experience of getting um, hands on with those buildings that Hardy himself experienced and wrote about. Um, thank you also for all of your questions. Um, I know certainly that um, if you want to get in touch with Rose about anything, um, her academic email is to be found on the UE website. So um, please do follow up with that. And um, other than that, thank you so much. And I would just encourage you, if you haven't already, please do go and visit our four exhibitions. We're in the last two weeks now. Um, and those letters that Angelique read the extracts from are on display at Salisbury Museum. So thank you so much to all of you and thank you to our panelists and our wonderful host.